All right, a lot of our last videos have talked about the zero input response, which is the solution to a difference equation when the input is zero for all time. So it's kind of a very easy case. We're going to start building up the complexity now. The next thing we're going to look at is how do I go about solving a difference equation for a system at rest when the input is a single impulse applied at time zero. So this is also kind of an easy case in that what we're going to solve the difference equation for is the case where the input is zero for almost all time except for the single input of one at time zero. So this is kind of the next simplest case to consider. However, it, it results in a very important definition. We're going to end up defining the impulse response of the system as the output of the system at rest when a single unit impulse is applied at time zero. So this does end up resulting in a very important quantity that we're going to end up using um, for quite a bit of the class. So let's go ahead and um, talk about how we might solve for the impulse response of a difference equation. One way to do it is to use the iterative approach. If a f you remember a few videos back, we use the iterative approach to solve for the difference equation solution. That approach works for any difference equation and for any input. So just as a way to get going, let's go ahead and work an example where we have a difference equation and we solve for h of k, that's what we mean by the impulse response, for the particular case where the input is an impulse. So let's kind of do this numerically to get going. And then in the next video, we'll actually talk about how you solve for the impulse response using more of an analytic closed form equation approach that is also useful. All right, so let's go ahead and work this example, iterative solution for h of k. So there's the title of the example we're going to work. And what we are going to do is we are going to find the impulse response for the discrete time system that is described by this difference equation right here. So that's the difference equation. Since we're told to solve for the impulse response, that means something very specific. That means my input f of k has to be equal to delta of k. That's what we mean by the impulse response of the system. It's the response of the system at rest when the input equals delta of k, an impulse applied at time zero. Also, we use some very special notation in this case. We reserve the notation h of k to mean exactly that condition. It's the output of the system at rest when the input was delta of k. So this right here, h of k, is very special notation. You should only use it, really, when you're talking about the impulse response of a discrete time system. So given that this is my input, and we're going to use this notation for the output, I can go ahead and rewrite the difference equation as follows. So replace all the y's with h's and the input f with delta of k, because that is what it is equal to. Our goal now is to actually solve for h of k. What time domain signal h of k satisfies this difference equation for all time? That's what I need to figure out. In this video, we're going to do that iteratively, one sample at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and move some of these terms, these terms right here, those two terms. Let's move those to the right side of the equation. So I now have h of k equals kind of all this stuff. And then I can pick particular values for k and one by one solve for the impulse response values. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. But as a recap, Let's think about the initial conditions, because I'm going to need to know those. If I want to compute h of 1, that means the impulse response at time 1, which is k equals 1, I'm going to need to know h at time minus 1 and h at time minus 2. So in the problem statement, I didn't tell you what those were. However, the definition of the impulse response is when the system is at rest. So we call that the zero state, which means all previous time outputs are zero. So at time minus one, our system was at rest, so it was equal to zero. At time minus two, our system was at rest, so the output was equal to zero. At time minus three, minus four, minus five, etc. So all of the initial conditions, because we're talking about an impulse response, we know are zero. All right, now we're ready to go. Let's pick a time, for instance, time k equals zero, and then replace all the k's here with k equal to zero. So I have h of 0 equals 0.5 h of minus 1 plus 0.2 h of minus 2 plus 3 delta of 0. Well, that's 0. 
because its initial condition, the initial conditions are the zero state initial conditions, that's zero, and the impulse response when its argument is zero is equal to one. So I have h of zero equals three times one, which is three. Let's keep going. What about when k is one? Replace all the k's right there with k equals one. I get h of one equals 0.5 h of zero plus 0.2 h of minus one plus three uh, times delta of one. So again, that is three, because we just solve for that, right? This one right here is zero still. And then the delta function evaluated, or I'm sorry, the delta function when its argument is not zero is always equal to zero. So we end up with 0.5 times three for this term. All the other terms are zero and we get 1.5. All right, let's go ahead and do one more uh, term. When k is two, again, replace all the k's here with two. So you kind of get the hang of it by now, it's pretty easy. We'll plug in 0.5 h of one plus 0.2 h of zero plus three delta of two. That ends up equaling 0.5 times 1.5 plus 0.2 times three. That is still zero. The delta function evaluated when its argument is non-zero is zero. So if you plug that into your calculator or do it in your head, you get 1.35. So we have now solved for the first three values of the impulse response of this system. Obviously, to solve for the entire signal, I would have to do this for forever, which isn't a great thing to do. So what we're going to learn how to do in the next video is actually come up with an equation for h of k that will hold for all time. In doing that, we're actually going to need to know a few of these initial conditions. So actually being able to do this iterative approach is still very important because you're always going to have to solve for a few of these values before you can use the equation for the closed form answer that we'll see in the next video. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed and uh, continue watching the next video to learn about how to solve for h of k using a closed form equation.